Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about the crypto ecosystem, right? All of how do all these pieces fit together? And just like a, eco, a natural ecosystem, right, where you have the plants and the animals and the sunshine, the weather, you know, uh, water, moisture, all these things, the atmosphere, everything sort of comes together to make it all sustainable. And you have all of these relationships that uh, work with each other, you know, up, up the animal chain and eating the plants and the photosynthesis and all that kind of stuff, right? So same thing with the, the what's going on in crypto, right? There's an ecosystem that's been developing around all these. Now, the first, the first thing that happened, right? We've talked about this was Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is still the largest and the central asset in this whole ecosystem. And uh, it's growing, it's the largest by market cap by far. Uh, it's about, you know, $1 trillion where Ethereum is next about 375, 400 billion, you know, getting close. And these other ones are smaller. So let's start talking about this. Uh, Bitcoin, and then there's a, a eco, little, you know, ecosystem built around Bitcoin, right? The derivative type of functions of ETFs, you know, electronically traded funds that are based on Bitcoin that now you can get uh, through the stock market, right? Uh, companies that have been putting Bitcoin on their balance sheets for a while. Uh, Tesla had done that. And the one big one, MicroStrategies, uh, Michael Saylor, brilliant guy. He has bought about, now it's about $5.3 billion worth of Bitcoin. He put his cash on his balance sheet was $500 million in March of, of 2021. He started buying Bitcoin and now that Bitcoin balance, that $500 million dollars is now 5.3 billion. So it's more than a 10 X gain in, in the cash that he had on his balance sheet. So talk about a brilliant uh, financing move for a company to do, right? And you can, you can buy MicroStrategy stock on the, on the stock market. So that's an interesting derivative of Bitcoin play. And then there's the exchanges, right? Where you can buy Bitcoin and you can trade it. You can sell Bitcoin, whatever you want to do. You can trade it for other currencies and also these are sort of some of the things around Bitcoin. Now we're going to talk about layer one, right? Layer one is what they talk about as the, the architecture of this whole ecosystem, the blockchains, the, the fundamental blockchains of these different cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin has its blockchain. It's a proof of work blockchain. We'll talk about that more soon in videos when we talk about blockchain in detail, right? Ethereum is the next biggest blockchain. These are layer one blockchains. Ethereum is also a proof of work blockchain, but it's moving to an Ethereum 2.0, moving to a proof of stake blockchain. And then we have Avalanche. AVAX is the token of the Avalanche blockchain that works on another different type of uh, consensus. These are all consensus mechanisms. And those sort of speed up. Those are one of the limitation, limiting factors, one of the constraints. Uh, Solana is a very popular one now. It can go very fast. Avalanche and Solana can do maybe like 65,000 transactions per second. They're starting to get up where they can compete with transaction platforms like Visa and MasterCard, credit card platforms, or stock exchanges like NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Still have a way to go, but that's what, that's what their niche is that they're starting to look at. And, and the way that these things operate, the limiting factors are something called the trilemma, right? And the trilemma was something posed by uh, 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 Vitaly Buterik, the guy who invented uh, Ethereum. And it basically is uh, that there's three different uh, things to optimize for. One is security on the blockchain. The other is uh, decentralization. How decentralized is it? The more decentralized it is, the more nodes you have trying to reach consensus. Obviously, that's obviously that's going to be a limiting factor in how fast the the blockchain can operate. And scalability. How how can it scale? How many users can it accommodate at one time? So as you try to optimize for one of these, you're doing it at the uh, expense of the other two. You maybe you can optimize for two and then you're expensive of the, of the other one. So it's like whack-a-mole, right? Trying to optimize for all three 
Um, it's sort of like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics, right? Where you can't know the position and the velocity of a particle at the same time because one influences the other. Each thing that you optimize for in this trilemma, you know, um, it has a, a, limitations on the other ones. So this is the big problem with blockchains right now. This is the issue that everybody's confronting and maybe some ingenious invention will come to, to fix that. Uh, Ethereum was doing it with Ethereum 2.0 where they're going to proof of scale, proof of stake, I'm sorry, for their, uh, for their consensus mechanism and also to sharding, which is splitting up the blockchain into littler elements. So there's all these different ingenious ideas to try to figure this out. But that's the limiting factors right now for this to scale up to t accommodate some of the applications like uh, decentralized finance. So uh, layer two is basically uh, dApps, they call them, decentralized applications that are built on top of these layer one platforms, right? And last year, a year ago, two years ago, all of the uh, decentralized applications were all being done on Ethereum. Since then, some of them have spread out to some of these other uh, competing layer one blockchains like Avalanche and Solana, and there's a couple others and all. So you're getting an idea about how this is working, right? Here's the fundamental blockchain that these guys are built on. And then you have these decentralized applications, the layer two applications that are built on that. And that's like decentralized finance where you have exchanges, or lending platforms, right? You have lending platforms like Aave and Compound. Uh, then there's the metaverse that everyone's talking about where you're actually gonna you know, be able to have an immersive experience, maybe virtual reality, where you can buy and sell using different tokens and cryptocurrencies in this uh, virtual worlds. Uh, Facebook just changed its name to Meta, trying to accommodate that. Uh, Square changed its name to Block, blockchain, right? to try to become a DeFi, a decentralized finance, to compete in that, in that realm. All these companies, you know, and, and, and Microsoft, and Google, they're all looking to these type of applications and how they're gonna fit in. Um, another big area of applications, and these applications, there's gonna be the killer app, right? Just like where there was with the, with the personal computer, the killer apps were spreadsheets, and that happened to Lotus and VisiCalc and then into uh, Excel, right? And uh, word processing was another big, you know, killer app. Slide decks like PowerPoint, those kind of apps that actually drove the usage. Something here is going to really be a breakthrough and drive the usage of this whole ecosystem, right? And that, that's what's basically happening. And it's really fascinating to follow this, right? Um, so the, another area is GameFi, right? Where we have... Uh, uh, Sandbox and Decentraland, and they have tokens. Uh, Decentraland's token is Mana, where you can go in and play games and actually purchase with those tokens, purchase swords or potions or whatever, you know, a castle, you know, real estate um, that you can do in there. Another area on here too is NFTs, right? Non-fungible tokens. That's a huge thing right now where people are making... Uh, uh, music or photo images, paintings, things, and selling them as NFTs for lots of money. And there's a big platform in exchange for doing that called uh, OpenSea right now, Open S-E-A, like C, C, like ocean. Um, so there's all of these applications happening on top of the, you know, these blockchains, Bitcoin in the center here, the trilemma is the thing that people are trying to work around and different, uh, different conceptual blockchains are coming up with different uh, ways to approach that. And so we have all of, all of those things. And then there's a new thing, the layer zero, right? Uh, underneath the layer one, you have all of these discrete blockchains and they don't interact. Well, how can you get them to interact? Well, there's layer zero applications that are coming out, platforms, where all of these can be connected so you can swap from one to the other. Polkadot is the big one there. So now you start to see, you'll hear these names, you'll see what they do, what's the problem they're trying to solve, what is their, you know, uh, application, and then you can fit it into this contextual type of format of, ah, oh, I see what these guys are doing. They're either trying to layer zero or there's a new DeFi application or whatever. And you can, you can start to understand how this all fits together. And then you, 
each of these blockchains, right, that is a world unto itself. It is a walled garden. You can't get in or out of it. That's part of the security piece, right? You can't get into it. Um, it it's tamper-proof, right, the blockchains. But in many applications with smart contracts and things, we want to get data from the real world, whether, whether it's temperature data or pricing data from stocks or whatever it would be, insurance data if you're making an insurance application. You want to get information and data from the real world onto the blockchains. And how do you do that in a manner that doesn't then restrict and make, if you're getting it from one source, then it's centralized and the whole idea behind these is the big D, right? And all these decentralized, decentralized. It's all about decentralization and even on the trilemma, right? So uh, th this is called the Oracle problem. How do you get off-chain data in a decentralized manner on chain, onto the blockchain. And Chainlink is a big uh, popular one right now that's really moving forward in creating uh, decentralized Oracle uh, protocols for getting off-chain data onto the chain. So that's another one you hear about, really exciting company. And it's just ingenious. All of these companies are fitting into this ecosystem and taking on different roles, right? And uh, making it all start to hum. So. The more this happens, the, the more inexorable it is that this is going to be a, a real success. And then we have, you know, the exchanges and the wallets. Well, how do you buy into this or sell it or trade it? And where do you keep your cryptocurrencies? You don't put them in your pocket, right? It's, it's internet of money, it's digital, right? So wallets are where you keep your, where you keep your cryptocurrencies and there's, basically three ways to think of wallets. One is a wallet that is uh, centralized, right? Like exchanges and Coinbase is a big one of that. A centralized one is on the web, very easy to use. Coinbase is super easy to use. There's crypto.com is another one, but Coinbase is really good. Uh, FTX is a big one, Binance. Uh, and Coinbase also has a wallet. So when you, it's convenient, right? You can buy it on the exchange. You can link it to your bank account and say, I want to buy a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. Okay. It makes that, that transaction for you. And then it stores it in your wallet for you on there. All very convenient. Another type of wallet that is decentralized, not centralized, like because centralized wallets could be, ha are potentially hackable, right? So people like to have a decentralized wallet. Well, there's ones that are on the internet, on the web, uh, the big one there is MetaMask. That's a very good one. It's used by a lot of developers because you can link it up to uh, test nets and things when you're when you're testing out different applications before you go live, and you can get uh, through what they call a faucet. You can get a little bit of that token so that you can actually see on the test nets whether your your application is working, troubleshoot your code, all that kind of stuff. So MetaMask is a big one. You hear about that. But that's online too, right? And so that also has its hackability type of uh, potential. And there's also, so and there's something called cold wallets where basically it's a hard drive or a, uh, a thumb drive or something that you take out of your computer and you store somewhere. The danger with those are is if you lose it, right? Or if you lose your, they, they say, not your keys, not your, not your coins, right? If you forget your, your passwords or something, you can't access these things. And that's happened in many cases, especially early on when people bought Bitcoin on a lark and then, you know, eight years later, oh my gosh, my Bitcoins are worth $500 million. Where, and they realize they can't figure out their, their, their uh, password or they lost it. Or in one case, a poor guy in England, right? He had a cold, he had a hard drive with his wallet on it and um, he had two hard drives and one was broken, he thought. So he threw that in the garbage and went into a dump, but he made a mistake. He threw his cold, you know, his cold wallet hard drive into the dump and he lost. Now it's worth like $500 million worth of Bitcoin. Such a tragedy. And he's been trying to reclaim it, trying to get into that dump. I think that they should set up a uh, decentralized organization, a decentralized autonomous organizations are another type of decentralized app on layer two, right? That are, are organizations that are set up with no leaders. Everything is done by the math, by the programming that's put into it. 
and people come together. They've actually pooled a bunch of money together. One of them, a neat application of that was they tried to buy a uh, copy at one of the original US constitutions and they bid for it and they lost to some billionaire, but they almost uh, were able to buy that. Imagine you get a bunch of crowdfunding, right? People pool their monies together and you go and do something neat like buy some cool piece of art like a Picasso or a Rembrandt or a, 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 a document like like the US Constitution or the Magna Carta or who knows, those kind of, or a Leonardo notebook maybe or something cool. Well, what if they got together a, a, a thing like that, people chipped in and they went and bought, just bought the landfill that this cold wallet is in and then did like a mining operation, dug through the dirt had to and found that and then were able to open it up and get that $500 million. Maybe the fella that owns it would say, you know, I'll take one fifth of it, 100 million, and then everybody splits up the other 400 million for putting up the money to do this treasure hunt. Wouldn't that be cool? That kind of stuff can actually happen with this kind of system. But uh, I don't think it's happened yet. But uh, so, and on uh, exchanges, same thing like wallets. There's centralized exchanges like Coinbase. That's a really good one. And they're actually, you know, we're talking about regulation and regulatory uh, approval coming along in scrutiny. Uh, Coinbase is very good at, at actually getting ahead of that regulatory, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission, other governmental regulations to actually operate. And then there's also decentralized exchanges, right, that work like all this decentralized stuff. Two of the big ones are Uniswap and SushiSwap. And they've actually just started to go on some of these other networks. They were built on Ethereum first, but now they're actually uh, deploying on Solana and Avalanche as well and things. So here you got the whole sort of uh, a picture of the overview here. So, you, you know, this is the, the 30,000 foot view where you actually see what's going on. Um, and hopefully this gives you a sense of where everything fits in. So as you start to read about this, you don't get bombarded by all these different, you know, phrases and tokens and applications and all, but now you have a context to slot them in and see where they sit in this type of ecosystem.